I'm going to begin with a word of prayer. Father, we do come before you and thank you for your goodness and your mercy that endures forever. You are powerful. You are good. You are mighty. We humble ourselves before you. We gather together as your church to hear your word, a word in season for each and every heart here. Cause your word to come alive in us. That it would not just be, Father, sounds that go inside an ear and not affect the heart. You want to affect and transform our heart. And we know you can because your word is alive and powerful. May we be open to you. May we be open to your lordship and the work of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. I'm going to begin from the book of Isaiah chapter 54, 54, for all of you who only speak Japanese. And it says here in verse 2, Enlarge the place of your tent, and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare, lengthen your cords, and strengthen your stakes. Verse 3, For you shall expand to the right and to the left, your, and your descendants will inherit the nations, and make the desolate cities inhabited. Verse 4. Do not fear, for you will not be ashamed, neither be disgraced. For you will not be put to shame, for you will forget the shame of your youth, meaning your past. And will not remember the reproach of your widowhood anymore. Verse 5. For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He is called the God of the whole earth. Come on, somebody. That is a powerful word right there. I wanted to share that with you because you can hear, you can hear that God is asking for you and I to increase, to grow, to develop. Always it's been on his heart. This is God's will. It's not to live contained, stuck in sin, in the past. That, does, that really doesn't help you at all. He doesn't want you, as we've been talking for the last couple of weeks, about breaking small. He doesn't want you to live conformed to things that are negative, not helpful, don't, don't, advance you in life don't push you forward in the will of God for your life and again I go back to a portion of uh, 2nd Corinthians chapter 6 from the message Bible where Paul the Apostle under the unction of the Holy Spirit says we beg you please don't squander one bit of this marvelous life God has given us God reminds us I heard you your call in the nick of time the day that you heeded, uh, sorry, that you needed me, I was there to help. Let me stop right there. He's referring right there up to this point. He's referring to our salvation. That when we called upon him, he says, I was there. No matter what kind of mess, Myrie Clay, you were in, I was there. Say God was there. We all have that testimony. If we've asked Christ into our hearts at any one point, he was there. Whether it was in despair, he was there. Whether it was in pain, he was there. Whether we were lost and couldn't find our way out, he was there. Even when we were in the midst and twisted up in sins and we just had one cry, God help me, he was there. He's always been there for you. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. As he was there for you, he will be there for anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord. Let's give the Lord a great big hand clap. And, and Paul called it, and I like this translation because he calls it, he says, don't squander one bit of this marvelous life God has given us. He's talking about our salvation. He's talking about the fact that you've been born again. He called it marvelous. We went over that if you've been with us. Marvelous is that word that simply means miraculous, you know, supernatural. But then he goes on in verse 11 and 13, still talking in context because of time. I'll pick it up in verse 11. He says, dear, dear Corinthians. Now, the Corinthians were, were believers. They were Christians and spirit-filled. Uh, a lot of the gifts of the Spirit in the New Testament church was working in their midst. And so, so you got to realize he's talking to 
a, a mixed group of people, but definitely he's not talking like to the world. He's talking to the body of Christ. He says, dear, dear Corinthians, I can't tell you how much I long for you to enter this wide, open, spacious life. He's talking again the, about the marvelous life he mentioned before. We didn't fence you in. The smallness you feel comes from within you. Your lives aren't small, but you're living them in a small way. I'm speaking as plainly as I can and with great affection. Open up your lives. Live openly and expansively. It's the adversary who wants to contain you and I or the church. You know, Jesus said it this way. Satan comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. The first thing he tries to do is to steal from you. If he can steal the word from you, then he begins to kill you, ultimately to destroy you. But he doesn't start, and it's in that order for a reason, because as we know from Jesus' other teachings, the enemy comes to steal the word out of your heart. And that word, his word, the Bible, the word of God, the promises of God are yes and amen, and they are miraculous. There's life in his word. That's why we, we, we really push in a most encouraging way for you to have a devotional life, for you to have to understand that this word called the Bible is the best word you can ever read. So many people take so much time to get educated in so many other ways, which is okay, but it will never do for you what the Word of God can do for you. It will never lift you up to the place that only the Word of God can lift you up. And so you need to understand it's from the Word of God that you begin to have some insight, but it's not so much in here as much as it is in here because Jesus said the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are alive. They're alive and powerful. Uh, the writer of the book of Hebrews says, every word is alive and powerful. There's no word without power that Jesus has spoken. So when you receive this word, you're not just reading mentally. It's nourishing you spiritually. Something on the inside of you is growing. Something on the inside of you is enlarging. Something on the inside of you is stretching into God's perfect will. For example, in Job chapter 8, we read this. It says, though your beginning is small, Yet your latter, your, your latter end shall increase abundantly. Say increase abundantly. Now right now some of you in this room may have never been taught about increasing or having an abundant life. Many of you watching me online say like, whoa, wow, what is this? What is this? This is called the abundant life. God wants, a, wants you to increase abundantly in all realms of your life. Spirit, soul, body, financially, socially, domestically, which means your family, your marriage, come on somebody, and in ministry. And it's important. It's the adversary that tries to conform us or to contain us. He tries to, try to get us to live by a set of circumstances that are not God's word, by a set of words that are found in the world but are not formed out of his word. And I want you to understand his word will set you free. It's knowing the truth that gives you the reality, whatever your perspective might be right now, there's no greater freedom you can ever have than knowing what God has said about your life, about what he paid for through the cross of Calvary, through the shedding of his blood and giving you resurrection power so you wouldn't have to stay small, so you can break small and break into God's perfect will for your life. The enemy always tries to restrict us or constrain us or hold us back. You know, and you need to understand that containment is a byproduct of conditioning. Let me give you an idea. It wasn't too long ago that I, I heard or reread a story and I thought I'd share it with you. A little boy had, a, had some relatives. He lived in the Los Angeles area and he wanted to go up and visit his relatives one summer and his parents sent him up there but uh, mom and dad said, listen, before you go, I want you to take your, your little goldfish bow and your little goldfish. Because we don't want to take care of them because, you know, we're not very good at that kind of stuff. And this is your project. You wanted it. So take it up to your auntie and uncles. And, you know, if you don't know anything about California, the, your auntie and uncle live close to what's called the Yosemite area up there. It's a forest area. Very beautiful. And they happen to have a little lake close by them. So... The little boy went up there, and as soon as he got up there, he didn't realize that the auntie and uncle had this, this beautiful little lake. And he was like, wow, 
Look at that lake. And he looked at the little goldfish bowl he had with the little goldfish in it. And then he looked at the lake, looked at the goldfish bowl with the little goldfish in it. And then he looked at the lake. And, you know, he was going back and forth. And he says, well, today, he's talking to the goldfish. I'm going to become your liberator. I am going to set you free. <laughs> he had a little speech and everything like that, you know. And he took him off the little dock. And he says, be free, little fish. Out on the water, and then the gulf, and he thought the fish would swim away, and there it was, just going around a little circle. I don't know what the sound is. But anyways, I was going around little circles, and the little boy started throwing little pebbles to kind of maybe scare him, maybe he'd fly, uh, no, uh, uh, swim away. He wouldn't do it, just kind of stayed in that little area. Well, the little boy says, you know, I'm a little hungry, maybe I'll go and eat some lunch, and I'll come back, and, uh, and, and see where this all stands. So he went up there, and about an hour and a half later, he came back to the edge of the dock, and there's a little fish was right there. Going around circles, just around in circles. And then all of a sudden, as he was looking at the goldfish, he saw the moving of the water in, a, in an unusual way. It got bigger and bigger and bigger. And right before he got to the goldfish, a huge bass jumped out and swallowed that little goldfish. I know, right? That's what the little boy said. Honestly, the boy, the little boy, was, you were very good. The boy, <laughs> you were really into it. And uh, anyways, the little boy was shocked. He didn't know what had happened. He was downtrodden. Well, that night, a friend came over to the uncle's house, and the friend, um, friend of the uncle was told the, the, the shock the little boy went, in, went into that particular day. And uh, so the friend explained to the little boy that a goldfish, once it had lived, in the circumference of a certain size over a period of time, it becomes conditioned to think small. And it will stay, the friend of the uncle said to the little boy, it will stay there either until it dies, swimming around in circles, never really realizing that there's so much it can experience, but because of its small thinking, it stays in a little circle or until it gets eaten by a bass. Anyways, and the point, the point of this, this little story is, is there a size of a fishbowl or container that has conditioned you in some way or another? We sometimes don't realize that we think smaller and we don't think as long. Oh, we get inspired by Isaiah 54. We might even get inspired by the... But are you changing how you think? And I know this is only a goldfish, but I remind you when Paul said, the smallness you feel comes from within you. Now, a number of years ago, many, many years ago, you know, uh, the Lord showed me a shoebox. I can't really say it was like a, I don't know what it was, but I got it because I'll show you why. And that shoe box, you know, was nothing special on the outside. I remember looking at it, and it kind of opened up. I looked inside, and there I was. It was me, but it was a little, little meeny, meeny, me. It was me, me, me. Anyways, and uh, there was nothing wrong with me. It was just really small inside this shoe box. I was comfortable. I was living the life that I understood. You know, I was just kind of bumping along, as you and I say, just doing, doing life. And then it was when I heard, I can't say it was the audible voice of God, but I thought it was, and this sound, what are you doing there? It's like me asking, what are you doing? And he said, well, what are you making reference to? But instantly I did understand he was referring, what am I doing in that box? And, um, and I understood the point that the shoe box was where and how I was living, at least in that little illustration. Not so much physically, but in my thinking, in my attitude, in my behavior, and in my lifestyle. The point was, I kind of felt that he didn't want me to live in what was comfortable. But instantly I saw a number of things. He pointed out to me how the box you live in, although you think it's big, from your viewpoint, from my viewpoint, I see everything I've made. 
And, you know, we think about it like this. Here you are in this room. It's pretty much is like a, a major size shoe box, pretty big shoes, right? But imagine that. And um, here you are, and you and I can navigate, make friends, fellowship, and just, uh, but, you know, a little bit bigger, you know, you can set your life up, and you get comfortable, and you think this is all there is, except for the fact that instinctively you know right now, speaking as I am, that there's something on the other side of these walls, and that's what's his point. Let me kind of illustrate this this way. We made a little model so that maybe you can get a little idea because sometimes we don't realize how we can get stuck but not realize it because we're either very comfortable, have developed certain habits and lifestyle, behaviors, characters, not necessarily wrong or sinful. That's not what I'm sharing about. I'm sharing about how we get stuck, not physically, but mentally. How we get stuck in our thinking, and I'm talking about biblical now. And so here uh, we're going to share something with you as they take off the, the this is kind of like a, a modernized box. Yeah, right. Thank you, Mitchell and Kaluna. Anyways, um, and so the other day I shared with you that there were four walls. These are not absolute the only ones, but there are four walls that contain it. I saw this box. It wasn't you know see-through but there's a reason why I want you to see the see-through and the Lord told me that there were things written on the walls that were keeping me in in this particular illustration for today I shared the four containers starting on our first Sunday and second Sunday it's the the wall of ignorance and ignorance simply means to be unlearned my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge when you don't know something you don't know something right and so uh, on that wall over there, let's just say, for our illustration, it says tradition. And on this wall back here, it says deception. On this one, it says distraction. Now, imagine. Now, what all these walls does, it puts a ceiling on you. This is what some of you may have heard this phrase before, a glass ceiling. You can see things, you just can't get to them. And what we don't often realize that this is not a physical thing. As much as it is, I hope this doesn't fall, as much as it is, it's mental. Imagine you living in here. There I am right in there. I'm so small, you can't even see me. But there I am. There's a house here. I got my car here. I got my family, friends. There's a community center. In other words, it's only an illustration of my little world. Emphasize little. I'm comfortable. It's convenient. I'm working. Whatever it is, I got my life. But it is from in here, this is sufficient. God, looking from out here, says, you're boxed in. He's looking at our lives, not from our perspective, but from his. And so he comes to us at times, and he says, you know, until you know my truth, you're going to stay ignorant. You're going to stay unlearned of how I really want you to live in freedom or in joy. Distractions, the Bible talks about how we are, be, be focused on the path in which we go. We get so distracted from the things that are important in life. I often tell people, never let what matters most be at the mercy of what matters least and the word of god is what matters most to you because it's the only thing that can help you to break through what you're about to see in just a second and the other side could be traditions jesus said you know your traditions have made the word of god of no effect and the back side of course is deception nobody wants to be deceived you know but jesus did say in matthew 24 verse 1 through 4 he warned us about deception that would come you know, when people try to trick us, you know, to be deceived means to be bamboozled, tricked, fooled, you know, in some way. It's when people tell you that, you know, you can't prosper or people tell you that, you know, you can't go that far. Or people tell you, oh, you can never be that. Now, imagine yourself living inside this box for a moment and you can see life out here on every angle. But every time you try to go to it, you hit the wall. Until you tear down ignorance, until you tear down the traditions that are holding you back, until you tear down the distractions, until you tear down deception, until you tear down the distraction, these walls stay up. And they place on you what's called 
a glass ceiling. And that's what the, this is a little bit fancier, but this is what the Lord told me. And for years, I have never forgotten this. Because, you know, with a glass ceiling, you can look up and say, the sky is the limit. You could just never get there. <laughs> so with the word, of course, what the new birth and the word help you to do is to break down the ignorance. You can tear it down. See, to break down, you know, the, the what is it? The distraction and break down what the deception and break down the traditions you can only do that through the lordship and when you break these walls down the fullness of god's life becomes yours and that's what god wants you to understand when he speaks to you you know we can uh, come on give the lord a great big hand clap on that and i'll move on because of time <clears throat> and i want us to understand because I, I i think it's it's so important that we get a hold of these simple things why because what's keeping you living small are not other people. It's not the houses, the buildings, it's not the, the community. It's our way of thinking. An unrenewed mind to God's word will always stay captive and captured to think small. Even if, imagine all of these people are born again. Good people, going to heaven kind of people. They're just stuck because of other things. Well, my daddy traditionally told me I could never amount to anything. Or, you know, well, I never, I heard a preacher tell me I could never prosper or do well in life. Or, you know, I heard a person, you know, tell me this and they see me about that. And then we end up buying into those things. Why I wanna to talk to you about this because you'll never outgrow the limits we place on ourselves or those we allow others to place on you. And so, it's impossible for you and I in life to perform consistently in a manner that's inconsistent with the way you see yourself in your mind's eye. You know you don't see yourself through your physical eyes. No, no, they, 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 you don't see yourself. It's like a, a lens on a camera. You see yourself with your mind. You see yourself with your thinking. Your thoughts are what hold you back. God's not holding you back. And so it's important that you understand. I, I once heard this written, I'm gonna share it with you. It says, if there's a difference between where you currently are and, and where you would like to be, it's not a lack of your God-given ability or potential, it's the thinking, the attitude, the image of who you think you are or who you think you are not. And it's important, when Paul said this, the smallness that you feel comes within you. It was not a reference to your salvation. It was not a reference to the new birth. It was not a reference to the power of the cross. It was not a reference to the power of the Holy Spirit. No, my friends. God doesn't, you know, deal out, if I can use that phrase, a greater salvation for one person and a lesser salvation for another person. No. He was talking about an unrenewed mind. A mind whose thoughts have not been changed to be in alignment with God's word. And so here's what I want you to understand. You can be of, um, in the same group of people, enjoying the same lifestyle, but have different mentalities because it's not up to the group as much as it's up to you. Let me give you an illustration, a little illustration. And, um, and it's a, it's a, I think it's a, it's a pretty good one uh, if you allow me to share it with you real quick in time. And... Um, I heard a story. It was a story about a king in Saudi Arabia. This guy was an avid, I mean, addicted golfer. I mean, he loved golf. He was so wealthy. And uh, his favorite golfer, though, at the time was Arnold Palmer. And uh, so the king contacted Arnold Palmer one day because it was a charity tournament there in Saudi Arabia and he wanted him to be part of it. And Arnold Palmer said to himself, well, I've never had that kind of an invitation. Sure, I'd love to go. So he went. He contacted the, uh, the right people there who invited him. And, and so the king of Saudi Arabia sent his private jet to America to pick up Arnold Palmer. And Arnold Palmer got into the luxurious jet when he arrived in Saudi Arabia. He's a luxurious hotel, the accommodations, nothing was spared. Luxury left, right, and center. 
Then the day came where Honor Palmer played the 18 holes with the king, and they really, really hit it off well. And uh, it was that charity event, the golf tournament, was uh, a, just a smashing success. It was spectacular. It, it made headlines in all the golf magazines. Even as it was, uh, was going, it was just really trending. And then it was time for Arnold Palmer to go back home. And so as he was getting ready, he heard a knock on the door. And the king, that king that invited him, had come to visit him in his, of course, at that time, a luxurious um, hotel room and the king said you know i want to honor you you've been so good everything went so well better than my wildest imagination what can i possibly give you and arnold palmer said no i don't need anything the memory is good enough thank you so much no 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 no. it's our custom here that when we are treated well we must it's our obligation it's our heart's desire to give a gift of honor to you and Arnold Palmer says, no, again, King, you really don't have to. You've been so kind. You've sent your private jet. You've put me up in this luxurious room. You've treated me so well. You've almost treated me like as I was a king. And the king of Saudi Arabia said, no, 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 no. I must give you something. Then Arnold Palmer just said, okay, okay, get a golf club then. I, I love golf. I collect golf clubs. Obviously, he was a golfer, right? And so the king says, okay, I'll give you a golf club, a special one. And Arnold Palmer said, okay. And so Arnold Palmer went back to the United States. And um, after some time, he, Arnold Palmer began to think about, I wonder what kind of golf club the king of Saudi Arabia is possibly going to give me. Maybe it's one that's covered in gold. Maybe it's one that has a bunch of jewels on it. Maybe it's one that has some kind of historical significance that somehow, some way, he got a hold of and he wants to give it to me. Oh, that would be awesome. Well, Days passed, weeks passed, months passed, and um, finally, Arnold Palmer received a registered letter from the king of Saudi Arabia. When Arnold Palmer opened it up, excitedly, there was no reference um, to the golf club that he thought, but to his amazement, what he discovered in that registered letter was a title deed to a 500-acre golf club. A beautiful, pristine, fully operational, successful 500-acre golf club. Arnold Palmer's thinking golf club. The king of Saudi Arabia was thinking 500 acres golf club. Imagine in the same environment, getting along with each other, living life, but the thinking on one versus the thinking on the other. That was the only point of that. Amazing. And so... I think it's important that you and I know, and I'm going to leave you with this, just with the little time that I have, because we're going to kick this off next week even more so. You see, you need to know how to break small. A lot of people, when the walls are up, want out. They just don't do what it takes to get out. And this is not... Um, towards certain people. Mindsets are very dangerous. And most people don't continue to grow in the Lord once they are born again. And that's why Paul, speaking to the church of Rome, born again, spirit filled, he says to them, this is the first thing you need to understand, that we are not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind that you and I may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. The first thing you need to understand is to change, to change from here into God's will for your life, to break small, you have to know it's God's will. You, you have to know it's God's will, not just a good idea that someone's giving you. So, and the key to all of that is understanding that the way you think will decide the way you live. Most people think, Listen, saying this respectfully, but I'm saying this in context. Most people get born again, and that's where they stop. They stop challenging themselves. They stop growing. They do not develop yet. They don't understand that the mind is the renewed mind. I mean, not just, I'm not talking about positive thinking. I'm not just talking about mental attitudes. I'm talking about a mind that's based on God's word. And that's how we started off. The mind is a deciding factor between the spiritual life and the carnal life. That's why it says in Proverbs 23, Solomon says, you know, for as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You are the way you think. 
And so God has a will for your life. That's never been in question. God has a will for your life, and you can accomplish God's will by living what I call the transformed life. But you have to be transformed. You know, once we're born again, that is one transformation. It's a miracle transformation. It is supernatural. It's miraculous. But it, the Bible also talks about the way we think. When your thinking doesn't align itself with God's word, then you'll take different pathways. And what we see is, and I'm not talking about church membership here. I'm not talking about whether you consider yourself, you, you know, just uh, somebody who knows about God. I'm talking about letting this word, which is designed to transform your life. This is why people live in, with all kinds of attitudes, because they think there's no way out. It's their thinking. Well, I don't think I can do that. I don't think I can go there. My parents told me never to think that way. I mean, bigger. My parents said, you're always going to be like this, that, and the other. And they, they go down that line. But see, here's what we have to understand. Spiritual life as a Christian, you know, is the same as physical life. If you don't put a demand on your physical life, it will, you, you can exist, but you'll exist undeveloped. In Christianity, it, it's called continuing, although you have experience in the church, you still act like a baby in the church. Don't look at your neighbor. <laughs> See, growing is really important. Growing up as a Christian, you know, could also be called to be transformed. You know, Will Rogers once said, people change, but not much. And they have this stuck factor, either because they get comfortable. That's why I said in the first, uh, our first time back, I said, don't defend small. Fight for God's word. Let his word change you. It has the power to change you. Now, listen if, with a few closing thoughts here. When I talk about being transformed, I mean to change and to renew your mind, your attitudes, your actions, your behavior, which ultimately affects your lifestyle. I'm sure it's no secret that many people that get born again act one way in the church and act how outside? Because they're not allowing the application of the word to become part of them. See, in the Greek, the word transform means metamorpho. I'm sure you've heard this. It's the process that a, that a caterpillar goes into a butterfly. Not too long ago, somebody gave our family, I don't know why, they gave us like 40 caterpillars. I know. Why? And, uh, but it was beautiful. We did get to see some that went from the caterpillar stage into the cocoon stage, and then they turned into these beautiful butterflies, and they flew away, and they lived for one day. Okay, so that's what I heard. So here's what I'm trying to share with you. Where a butterfly changes once, and it's over. For the believer, they change constantly, and they never stop growing, or it's over. See... The thing is, this is where stagnation comes. This is where we get stuck in small when we stop growing. When was the last time you deliberately tried to grow in the things of God, either to envision or to dream or to stretch your faith or to do something that God says, even though it's different of how you were educated or what you've experienced, God's word is now telling you this is truth, not your past, but my word will set you free from your past. Amen. And so I think it's important that... Um, as Christians, the metamorphosis that we have is ongoing. Most Christians don't get that. You know, from the day we're born again to the day that we go and meet Jesus, you know, we should constantly be growing. It's a never ending. This is why marriage is stagnant. This is why relationships end. This is why people stop in their financial pursuit. This is why the joy, they think they've tapped out. You've done, you cannot possibly tap out the salvation of God. His salvation is unlimited. And the second thing is, remember this, information is not changing. There are so many people who can regurgitate information, there's just no revelation in what they're regurgitating. 
And so they're inspired, but they're not transformed in their lives. And, and, and people say, well, you know, I got this new, I got a new car and I got a new house and I got a, a, a new uh, job and I got a new relationship. Yeah, but that doesn't mean you've changed. You can buy all kinds of things that are new. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm, I'm not putting things down, but that doesn't mean you changed. Most people try to change by putting things around them. But transformation is what goes on inside of you. And if you imagine you can, have, you can have things around you, but do you still have that same old attitude? Yeah, you know, again, let's take this on a positive. You, you can have those things and still be the same person. And this is why Paul says, examine yourself in the faith to see if you're walking by the fruits thereof. You know, are you more depressed, more sad, more mad, more agitated, you know, more cranky, you know, and uh, less involved, you know. And these are things that don't change because of things around you. They change because of what God's doing inside you. And that's his word. His word comes to you unadulterated, uncompromised. And finally, I, I share with you, I just mentioned it, but it's, remember this transformation that we're going to be talking about that's going to really help you to grow out of this, to get a vision beyond the walls of this and maybe some other things that are not written up here. Transformation is an inward change. It's inward. It's inward. Your mind has got to be renewed to the word of God. I'm not just talking about Again, I go back on this because some people sometimes misunderstand it. It's not positive thinking. It's not just positive speaking. It's not about positive. It's God's word. I mean, it is positive, I guess, right? But it's God's word, his living word. You see, remember, I'm not talking about learning. Many people learn. But learning is not changing. Learning is not transformation. Learning is not renewing your mind. Learning is information, and there's a place for information and inspiration. But you can learn a lot and change very little in your life. What do we say? Well, you know, I know I should be a better husband. I know I should treat my kids better. I know I should not be in strife. I know I, the Bible says I shouldn't walk in unforgiveness. I know I shouldn't be offended. But people don't really cleave to the word and they stay the way they are. Even though they have information, you've got to be grounded on the final authority of God's word. See, your life, is it different from the inside out? This is what we're going to learn to do. And listen, God is no respecter of persons. What we're going to learn from the Bible is going to help you that no matter how you were born into this world, what you're going through currently in this world, God has a plan for you to get out of it and to go into his word and take it to a whole new level of living your life. Amen? So really what I'm talking about when it comes to transformation or what Paul was talking about by the renewal of your mind, it's called maturing. It's called maturity. It's called growing, increasing, developing. It's called prospering. It's called enlarging. So that's what Christianity is all about. It's not staying stuck. It's not saying, I don't know when we're going to get it. I don't want to get all the blessing. I don't want to get anything. Well, no, 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 no. The same God that saved them is the same God that saved you. And that same word that worked for them is the same word that will work for you. He's no respecter of people. And that's good news. See, and this is why, you know, you don't ever make it about the color of your skin. You don't ever make it about, well, I live in Hawaii versus California versus Las Vegas. Or if you were me and I was you and this, that, and the other. No, no, no. That is distraction. That is all distraction. They'll make it about other things, but they won't go to the Word. They'll say, yeah, 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 I know that's where the Word is, but this is the real issue. No, no, what the real issue is is the word of God, his word, not man's word, not others' word, his word, final authority in your life. When you choose, it will help you to understand what that means because in all in all, we just become more like Jesus when we're transformed. And we become less like that man. You know, we have two states that we're in. There was the BCU, and now they're <laughs> before Christ, right? That, we don't want to live like that old man. We don't want, and Paul dealt with these things in the New Testament. 
He talked to believers that were as excited and as passionate and even involved in certain things at church. And he was still challenging them. Hey, let go of the old man. Lay hold of the new man and learn to walk. That's a process and we can do it and we will do it because our champion has done something marvelous in our lives. You receive something? Give the Lord a great big hand clap. All right, let's all stand to our feet if we would, please. I went eight seconds over. <laughs> Don't forget to, to seize life. I want to pray for us and pray for you. And we have many good things. A lot of this is going to be breaking into this new year, 2021. We want to show you how it's done. It's not because of personalities. It's not because of, you know, how many years a person has had in church in terms of seniority. or well, they get all the blessings, you know. You know, but I'm here to tell you, this is good news for every person. Good news. You know, the, the, the doorway is being born again. And then once you're born again, then we have to renew our mind. Most people never really get taught about the renewing of the mind so that we can break small and break into God's will for our lives. Some of us, we're going to be challenged with, not with me, but with the word. And it's going to ask you, for example, the, just that whole thing that he wants you to increase abundantly. Well, that might not even be part of your vocabulary. Not only will it be part of your vocabulary because it's his word, it's going to be part of your vision and part of your dream because that word, increasing abundantly, is not man-given. It's God-authored. It's his word for you. You know, you might be going through a struggle in a relationship, might be going through a struggle in your marriage or with your family. You know, this is it. If you want to let go of sin, if you, you know, people can know that that is wrong for me to do without the word there's not enough church services in itself, a church service, that will ever get you free. You've got to make a commitment to this word. And this word will set you free. Jesus said, you'll know the truth, and the truth will give you freedom. Father, I come before you right now in the name of Jesus, and I pray over every person. Those listening online and those here in person, they carry such high value. Lord, you've done so much and everything that was ever needed for any man, any woman, from any background to walk in greater freedom. Not because of the things they do in and of themselves, but because of what you did at the cross of Calvary. And Lord, I pray that you would visit your people as they read your word, that you would unveil and show them your insights. As only your word, which is alive and powerful, Lord, I, I pray that maybe those who have struggled because the enemy has tried to distract them, Lord, as they focus, they're going to sense the life of your word, the promises that are yes and amen for them. And hope is going to rise up, Lord. Courage is going to rise up, Lord. Strength is going to rise up a different viewpoint of how to look at the world in which they live. The things, Lord, I know that once we're intimidating, Father God, will not be intimidating because you are the greater one that they're relying on that lives within them. So I pray, Father, that you would help us. We humble ourselves before you. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. It's constantly working in us. Lord, we simply open up our heart and ask you, teach us, lead us, guide us, instruct us by your Holy Spirit. Make your word real to us. We're all choosing, Lord, to break free of thinking small, living small. We want to live according to your promises, to the Bible, to what you've done through your son, Jesus Christ. I thank you for the increase, the abundant increase on each and every person here in this room. I thank you, Father God, that their best days are before them, not behind them. We declare, Father God, we forget those things which are behind us and we reach forward to that dream, that vision, that life in Christ that you have for us, Lord. We receive it now and thank you for the supernatural working of your word in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen and amen. So let's do this. 
You're never going to forget this box. Amen. So don't forget, today is a great day. You start now. You don't start next week. You start now. You've got a lot of word today, so I want to encourage you. If you've never gotten one of these here in uh, service, we'll give you a hard copy if you need one, certainly. But online as well. You can go online, and the same devotion will be online, and you can follow us. I just like a paper copy. You know, I like to put my notes down. And so, anyways, we want to bless you and let you go. They're going to open up the back doors. Have an amazing day. Can't wait to see you next week because we're going to continue to unpack this thing so that we can break free of all things. Amen. Shalom. God bless you. Aloha.